Is that okay? Is that all right? Are you going to give me the signal? Or no? All right. Yeah, I just switched it off. In case you heard my stomach rumbling. I think we've got about another 10 minutes. Maybe. For sure. It's probably going to be quite a short talk anyway. So <laughs> should get to the beer quicker. Shall I just start? Ooh, people come in. So as soon as you say that, I can come in. Right, I'll start. Okay, I'm Steve Millage. Uh, I'm the founder of Pyora. If you've heard of Pyora, uh, it's a it's derived from Glassfish. Okay, so we took Glassfish source code, put it into GitHub, and we developed on top of the old Glassfish open source 4.1 code base, and we create Pyora server with support. Uh, this is an interesting talk for me. Uh, People come in. Uh, interesting talk for me because I picked it up from a colleague. Okay, a colleague, a colleague in a sister company was supposed to be at J Days, uh, and he approached me and said, "Oh, I'm going skiing. I can't do it," uh, which was nice. <laughs> so I said, "I'd do it." Uh, and then two weeks ago, he sent me his talk and thought, "I can't do that. I can't do your talk." It was, he, he came from a consultancy that was all about independence and, and things like that. I come from Pyara, which is one of the ones we're looking at. He said, you'll be able to do the talk because you do Pyara, you do Pyara Micro. Uh, so I scrapped his talk completely and wrote one from scratch. Okay. So, uh, and he, I had the title though and the abstract that I had to work to. So hopefully I've fitted into that. The question is, Java e microservice platform, which is best? which made sense for him because he came from a consultancy company. It doesn't make sense for me. Okay, because that's the answer, right? So, that's what it says on the back. That's the answer to the question. Time for the party. <laughs> so, so I thought, what am I gonna do? Okay, I've got two weeks to write this presentation. I know nothing about Spring Boot. I know nothing about Malphite Swarm. Uh, I know a lot about Pyora Micro. What I decided to do, basically, is to get serious and look at, right, first we'll look at what is microservices. We'll get all that, that bit out of the way. And I thought it's a good opportunity as someone who writes Pyro Micro to look at the competition. So what I actually decided was after I ditched his presentation, which was all about requirements and software development life cycles and how they fit in there, I thought, actually, now what I'll do is I'll build microservices on each three platforms I won't build them live here, unfortunately, but I will show you all the code, and I thought I'd let you decide which one's the best. Is this a solution? I've got my own opinions, of course, which you've already seen. Uh, there is that slide at the end. Well, actually, there's not. But. So, uh, again, it might be quite short, this presentation. It depends. Basically, I'm going to show the code, so how fast the code talk really depends is whether you ask any questions and if I remember to show bits that are interesting. Okay, so I'm going to show an application built with Wildlife Swarm, Pyro Micro, and Spring Boot. And I'll show them running. Uh, that's about it, really. And then you can decide. So let's look at microservices first. So this is the Wikipedia definition. 
it's arch one, it's first point, uh, got my pointer on. it's an architectural style. So microservices isn't Spring Boot, despite what Pivotal will tell you. Uh, it's not cloud native Java, whatever the hell that means. Uh, it's a software architectural style, okay? Where you take a complicated application and you make it more complicated by splitting it up into lots of little applications. Uh, no, so, okay. You take the application and you make it into small independent processes that communicate with each other over language agnostic APIs, which traditionally will mean, well, standard in most places will mean REST. But it doesn't mean, you know, necessarily uh, require REST or anything of that form. And there we have uh, Martin Fowler definition, which is quite long. We have some key points. One is that we're basically just defining our application as suites of independently deployable services. Why are we doing that? One is to change our projects and our development teams to work around small components. Okay, those components are then have their own version lifecycle, and they can then be automatedly deployed in different versions from different uh, from each other, They're independent of each other from deployment and versions. And we can split out the business capability into, say, if you've got uh, billing as a separate thing from, say, product. And then once we've done that, and we have a agnostic language agnostic API, you can then choose to build your, like, your, your uh, microservice in whatever language that you would like. Uh, I'm not going to discuss really how practical that is in many organizations. However, one of the things to remember when you come towards microservices, now we build a microservices platform, but on top of we also build a monolithic application platform. One of the things to uh, remember is you are not, or most people are not Google or Netflix or you know, Facebook. Okay, most people are actually building stateful, transactional business, line of business applications in their career and this may or may not be the right way to go about to build those sort of applications. Because let's go through some of the, some of the principles. First one is to basically build components. Now we've been building components since, I don't know, 90s. And they're the same components, okay? It's the same idea. You build a piece of software that has a well-defined interface, contains, has, uh, masters its own data, and it may generate events into the architecture. That's been the definition of like a component since, well, since, since the word was invented. Okay? And because it has a well-defined inter interface, it is independently replaceable and upgradable. So you're basically building, taking your monolithic application and splitting it into components with different life cycles. And then you can take those and you can organize them around individual business capabilities. So you can align a development team with a business unit rather than uh, having you know, middleware specialists, database specialists, testing specialists spread across the whole business. So it's a, also a, a team thing. Uh, and then, which is a bit that most developers probably wouldn't like, but there you go, is to build products, not projects. Okay, and what that really means is that you're align, you take a uh, billing component, you build it as a product, and what that means, as someone who works in a product company, it means that you live with it for the rest of your life. Okay, you don't build a project and then I'll, you know, bog off to the next interesting project. Okay, you have to live with it, you have to evolve it, you have to have a product life cycle, uh, you have to uh, support it, you need to fix it. Uh, many organizations aren't built like that, that money follows projects and therefore uh, projects are what everyone builds software. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be actually organizational, I'm no organizational specialist here, but I, am, I can envisage organization nightmare of how you actually fund product lines, because most organizations aren't built like that. And most consultancies are definitely not built like that. So they come in and spend your money and build your projects. However, so independent replacement upgradable, 
these bits here, infrastructure automation and those sort of things, that's just technology, okay? It's nothing to do with architecture, but it enables automation. And given that each component is also a data master, you end up with decentralized data management. Okay? So one slide I haven't put on here is the fallacies of distributed computing, which is, which is going to hit you in the face immediately. Okay? If anyone knows the fallacies of distributed computing? Oh, how many people build distributed systems? Oh, everyone, a lot, a few. And you don't know the fallacies of distributed computing. Okay, they've been around since year dot. They essentially are, I won't name them all because I'll get them wrong. You know, uh, the network is always reliable, bandwidth is infinite. Uh, what the others? <laughs> There's about seven, and I, I've forgotten them, and in my previous talk I actually had them on the slide, so that's how good my memory is. Okay, but essentially, distributed systems are hard, and you've taken an a application, and you're going to split into lots of little things that communicate over the network, and there's a whole load of pain involved in that. However, they also make it highly scalable. So, so let's, take, let's look at an example. So here's an application. Uh, current terminology is monolith. Okay, that's obviously chosen by people who uh, push microservices to be derogatory terms. It has negative connotations in English. But it's actually, it's an application that you build and you deploy together. Nothing wrong with that. So like, for example, we've got stock control, so it's an e-commerce site. We've got stock, offers, discounts, loyalty cards, warehousing to ship things out of the product. We have a catalog, we have build people, we have, the sh you know, we have a shipping tracking application, and we have a customer database. And you could build that all as one big application, you know, in Spring or whatever technology you wanted to, where all these calls in between them are all like in-process calls. The problem with that, and you move into the cloud world, et cetera, is that that is your unit of testing, your unit of deployment, your unit of scale. And that's, that's really where people are going into microservices from, because that has, has problems, okay? And in your development team, your dependencies are fairly tightly coupled, and your development team builds the whole thing. So microservices is really coming around because of when you move into sort of cloud architectures. So the idea is you, you split all those up into components, little applications. Uh, you can independently scale them, so if you need a lot more on the product catalog, because it's front-end web, then you can add, say, four units of that, okay? And if you need more on customers, you can add three units of that. Shipping could be a third party, we've got a couple of those. And, and basically, you rely on all your project teams around each one of the products, and they build the whole thing, okay? API application, data storage. So that is my take on microservice architecture. So, it's got a bit of FUD around at the moment, here, uncertainty and doubt, that you can't build microservice architecture with Java EE, it's too fat, it's too heavyweight, it's too monolithic, it's impossible to do it, you must use something else. So the point of this talk, really, is to compare and contrast uh, through real code, whether this is true or not. Okay, so obviously I think it's not true. So Java EE now is not Java EE in the 1990s, in the same way Spring now is not Spring in the 90s, well, in the noughties. All right. Uh, I've been around in programming since the 90s, and when we saw the EJB spec, I used to work in an object database company, and we laughed. Uh, we did JDO and all that sort of stuff, which was precursor to JPA. It's still one, but we laughed anyway. So it's not the same, it's completely different. Forget J2EE, and a lot of people actually still spout nonsense around it, and actually it's to their detriment to say, actually, you know, you have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, it's very rapid to de develop. Most of the alternative Java frameworks embed Java EE, okay? Most people forget that Java EE is just a bunch of specifications in the standard body, servlets, JPA, J JAXRS, it's all Java EE APIs. So it's really designed around just building business functionality. And it produces actually now, because you build into an API, it produces very uh, small, skinny bars. 
it also gives you a, a solid version runtime, which in the microservice world you know, helps. You can build a Docker container with one of these technologies that I'm going to show. You can have it fixed, and the only thing you need to add to it is the WAR file, or you need to build a jar on top. So, like I say, I got my colleague's talk, and I thought, oh my god, that's rubbish. I can't, I can't, I can't talk about that. Uh, Could you come from a more business background? So I thought, right, I'm going to have to build something to demonstrate the three of them. Uh, and so I thought, what am I going to build? And I thought, right, what I'll build is obviously a RESTful web service. We're talking microservices. And then I thought, I need some data. So in the UK, the government releases a lot of data under opendata.gov. That's UK. Uh, so I took something that would be uh, really of interest to a Gothenburg crowd. I took roadworks on roads in the UK. <laughs> because I know that's important. So basically, the UK government releases an XML feed of all the roadworks that are going to be on the major highways in the UK, which is you know, quite handy. Handy if you need some data to do some demos, anyway. So what I'm going to do, well, what I'm going to show, because I'm not going to do it, is basically what I did is I took uh, this data, I ingested it into my SQL database, and I thought, I will build a RESTful web service RESTful microservice on each of these three platforms to walk you through the code, and then you can decide you know, which one's best for you. So uh, the RESTful interface was going to have like slash roadworks, will give you all JSON a feed of every roadwork in the UK on the major road network. Uh, slash roadworks slash now would give you the ones now. Uh, I didn't actually implement that, but I could do. Slash roadworks slash road would give you like all the roadworks on a specific road. Uh, which I have implemented. And region would give it for like a, a region of the country, which I haven't implemented, but I could. So I basically went off uh, and built those three uh, RESTful web services. Sorry, that RESTful web service in all three technologies. So what are the three technologies? So I'm going to look at Pyro Micro. So I built Pyora Micro. I basically took Glassfish open source, uh, which is obviously reference implementation of Java V7, and had some design goals. Okay, first design goal wasn't just to clone Spring Boot. First one was actually to take to take a Java re application server and build it for the cloud. What that means is one is that it's elastic in auto cross stream. So no domain. No, no installation. Uh, so you don't have to pre-configure all the domain or anything like that. You don't have to create data sources. Well, you do, but not through an administration console and things. Essentially, to make it container-friendly. OK? It's very small foot. Make it as small footprint as possible. Very easy to use. You don't have to mess around with Maven to do it, even though we will do here. So essentially, my, my goal was that all I want to do is create, run a WAR file. So build a WAR file, because you can build a WAR file on any IDE without Maven or anything else, uh, and just run it on the command line. That was the goal I set off to, to do. So we'll see. Power Micro doesn't build an Uber jar. If anyone knows what an Uber jar is, it's basically an application of just one jar. Because to be honest, I didn't see the point of doing that, because it doesn't affect your container, you know, building a Docker container, but you don't need to have more than one. You can actually have two files in a Docker container. So. so I didn't do that, but I could do, because it just would be easier to add the WAR into the jar and use get resources stream and deploy it. So. But we haven't done that yet. I can feel the pressure building, though. We're also looking at Wildfly Swarm, OK? Wildfly Swarm takes Wildfly, which is the uh, open source version of JBoss, uh, and you compose your application server by specifying a bunch of Maven dependencies. And that does generate an Uber jar for you, one big fat jar. And it integrates with some of the other Red Hat projects. But again, it's Java -y, Java -y based. And they have some libraries for integrating with service discovery technologies of theirs and OpenShift and things. 
And then I took Spring Boot, because obviously that's the, that's, the, that's the elephant in the room, or the boot in the room. That obviously takes Spring uh, and encapsulates it into create an Uber jar where you can just run it from the command line. And it also embeds an application server, Jetty, Tomcat, on the server. And, 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 it, and it basically helps you build wade through the complexity of Spring dependencies and very quickly and easily uh, using the auto configuration. And it provides a lot of production ready stuff out of the box. So it's quite opinionated on, on what it configures for you. So, let's, so that's, that's the intro. Let's have a look at some of the code. So I've, I've hardly got any screen resolution here, so bear with me while I try and find stuff. I'm going to close my previous talk projects. So all the code is on GitHub, so you can just down take take the project and build it with Maven. It's all on GitHub. So I've got three three projects. I have Spring Boot, Wildfly Swarm, Pyara. So let's look at Pyara first. Uh, so Pyara is Java E7. So let's have a look at building these RESTful web services with Java E7. So the architecture we have from the bottom up, uh, we have an entity being. OK. Everyone familiar with JPA? OK. So we have an entity being, a JPA. Uh, entity that is got a table called planned works, which is a table within MySQL, where I'm going to ingest the data into it. I won't show the ingestion, but effectively, this has got XML, JAXB entries on it, so that I can just parse the XML and into entities and then store them. So it's fairly standard JPA entity. And to see, one thing I know, I had to name the table. That was just for compatibility with all three, so they all work on the same thing because you have uh, IR Micro uses Eclipse Link and the others use Hibernate, and there was slight default naming issues. I defined three queries uh, find all, which is basically select from planned works, find by road, select from planned works where road equals road, and by road and date. Between two dates. Okay, these are standard JPA query definitions. And then we've just got a bunch of uh, fields. Again, some of the columns have been named explicitly, and that's just for interoperability between the two, two platforms. Okay, Eclipse Link by default will call it something like that, start date. And uh, Hibernate by default will put start dash date as the table name, just so things don't work together. So I've had to name some of the columns that have camera case in them explicitly. So that's my entity bean. Uh, that does all maps everything into the database. I then have a uh, session bean wrapping that. So we have a stateless session bean at stateless. That, that creates an EGB in Java E7. We inject the persistence context, uh, which gives my, my entity manager. And then all it does is basically call through the ent entity managers to, find, to call the actual queries we defined previously on the uh, entity and returns them as a list of objects. Yeah, the reason to put a session being in there is because that gives us transactions, transaction wrap around that method call. Could have done the same thing with CDI, but I didn't. Uh, and then we have a RESTful web service. Okay, so we have a RESTful web service, has a path of slash, uh, and then I've got a get, which produces JSON, which gets all the works. Essentially just return, calls the finder and returns the list of all the works. Uh, and we have one by road, which has the path slash road slash the name of the road, and then get works by road. Uh, 
takes the, that's the path that we map to on the rest, and this is, it takes the parameter name, and maps into that, that parameter there, and then I call that through the EGB. Okay, pretty simple stuff. So, if I quickly look at a, the POM for this. So, the, so I am building this in Maven, but I don't need to. If you look at the dependencies in the POM, we only have two. One is Java EE, and one is MySQL, because I need to put in the MySQL driver into uh, the WAR file. One thing people who maybe not come from Java EE for a while is they may think, well, where's my data source? So Java EE Lite allows you to define data source in web.xml. It actually also allows you to define a data source as an annotation. So my data source is defined in the web.xml. Okay, and then I package the data source and the driver in the web.xml, in the WAR file. Sorry. So if I build that, well, let's clear it. Let's get the top. So there's no dependencies on the Pyro Micro on Pyro Micro. Okay, you've only got Java EE and uh, MySQL just to embed it. So that's built. For some reason is there we go. So to run it in Power Micro, we just do Java, mi Java minus jar. I actually have a copy of Power Micro jar there. And we deploy, which one else I'm also going to do? We've got another command line, which is no cluster, because Power Micro clusters by default. We just minus deploy uh, target. It takes that WAR file. Okay, so that's deploying our microservice. It's ready. And here's one I did earlier, which is actually old. So it's, by default, it will run on port 8080. I get rid of roadworks. You'll see that. So that's JSON of all the roadworks in the UK. <coughs> In typical fashion, we have to suffer loads of them. Okay. If I just wanted them on the M1, which is the main motorway, whoa, I did it wrong. It's road slash M1. That gives you all the roadworks on the M1. Pretty simple stuff. Another thing to do, I open tab. Just run Visual VM here, just so you can see. This is our microservice here running. If you look at the monitor, oh, it's not going to work very well in here, is it? Uh, former GC. A heap. Uh, you can't see on here. Resolutions are good. I've got those figures later. The heat typically is about 40 megs. Okay? It's pretty small. So you can see that that's all you need to do to run a WAR file. You can see it started up in 6.4 6 seconds, deployed a WAR file, uh, and there you go, it's running. So that's PyR Micro. PyR Micro. Don't need any dependencies on Pyro Micro. You just build a WAR file and deploy it. And you can obviously package that up onto a Docker container because that's the command you need to run, just the Java minus jar. So let's have a quick look at Wildfire Swarm. So, source code wise, Obviously, Wildfly Swarm is uh, also Java EE7. So the source code is actually identical. Even though I've copied it in here, it is actually identical code. 
So we still have our, uh, our entity bean. It's exactly the same. So I did work to make sure that all the table names were the same and all the columns were the same. So Wildfly Swarm is exactly the same code. difference in Wildfly Swarm is, so Wildfly Swarm, what you do is you can choose which bits of the application server you want. I on Micro, you just get a web profile application server with some extra bits, which is concurrency and jbatch, clustering and things like that. Wildfly Swarm, you can choose to which bits you want in your application server. So it looks like a POM. So the POM is actually Similar in that we have Java EE Web API dependencies. We have MySQL dependency. However, you also have to say which bits of Wildfly Swarm you want, okay, in your application server. So we've got EJB. Uh, we want JAXRS and Weld, and that gives us JAXRS Weld gives us our uh, CDI and RESTful web services. EJB will give me my session bean, and JPA will be my entities. Okay. So you do have Wildfly Swarm dependencies in there. Uh, you also need a dependency on their bill of materials. And then there is a plugin at the end, which is just executed on package. And what this does, this builds the Uber jar, okay? So this, what this, warp, what this actually does, this POM, this, yeah, this POM, is it builds the WAR file, and then it runs the Wildfly Swarm plugin to take the WAR file and wrap it up into a JAR file. So if we go into so basically to build it, it'll do the same, clean the package. Okay, so that first it'll build and compile the code, build the WAR file, which has got building WAR there. It built the WAR, and now it's doing the web wildfly swarm bit. And out of that, it produced a, uh, not spat it out, anymore. it produces a JAR file. So if I look in the target, you can see it creates the WAR, and it also creates something called swarm.jar. Okay, swarm.jar you run directly. So unlike Pyro Micro, you don't have to specify the WAR file on the command line. Okay, and that will boot a Wildfire application server and deploy the WAR file to it. Okay. Let's go quickly look at make sure that worked. So again, if we go directly hit the same exactly the same URL, we get exactly the same data back. All right, so the code, let's say, Java recode is identical, no difference at all. So that's essentially Wildfly Swarm. So let's look at Spring Boot. So what surprised me, okay, so I'm someone who actually didn't know Spring before I built this application. One, it's very easy, and two, the code is damn similar. So, it's surprisingly very similar. So let's look at our Spring Boot application. Just close the door. So let's start at the bottom. Uh, I copied in my JaxB classes, but that's just for my own convenience, rather than uh, building it all from scratch in the POM. So here's our entity. Uh, obviously, Spring, Boot, Spring supports JPA through Hibernate, so I actually have the same, effectively the same entity code as I had in Java E7. If I then go to next layer up, which is the service, so Basically, I create an interface to do the get all and get by road. This is equivalent to our EJB. And 
then created the implementation of that. So that is basically a component and it's transactional. So that's given us our transactions around the queries that we wanted. So we need to query in a, in, in a transaction. Also created a Roadworks repository. Okay, this is a bit like our entity manager. So you define our queries on here, select from plan works, select from plan works where road equals road. And that gives us our CRUD repository. And within the service, so I'm basically injecting the repository. And I uh, get all and I get by road both call the uh, repository functions. I then create the REST application. So we've got a REST controller. We inject the uh, service. And then we've got the mapping to slash roadwork, which calls get all on the service, and the request mapping to the road, which uh, basically calls get by road. Okay. And finally, we've got the application itself. So we have a Spring Boot application, has a main, which basically runs this application. Uh, we've also got servlet component scanned, but that's just because I've got a data loader servlet which ingests the uh, XML and, and creates all the entities. I, I wouldn't need that just for the RESTful web server. So that's essentially our application. The other piece we have, which is different in the, in both Wildfly Swarm and Pyaro, obviously we define our data source in the web.xml. Here we're going to basically use Spring Data, so we have a uh, property file, which is what I find. Which is basically set in our data source, username, password, and the class name for the driver. Okay? So, if I build that, So basically, clean package that. Again, in, in the target, that built a, uh, a, a jar file. Sorry. So all I need to do to run it is run java minus jar. Okay, so that's basically booted up our Roadworks application in Spring Boot. And we should see exactly the same data. Okay, so we're hitting the same database, same data, just a different, web, just a different programming style. Okay, any questions on those applications? Don't, don't kill me for my Spring code, because I only learned it at the weekend. So and this is, there's probably layers I could remove, squash both both technologies. I could squash some layers out of that, but I've got figures. I'm only not showing you because resolution doesn't work. I've got some figures at the end of the slides. If you want to see the others, okay. So we're back to the slides. So basically, I built those three, three, three applications, and you can get the code and, and play with them yourself. So what I tested, these are the te things I tested. Uh, I tested on not this machine, not on a development machine, which is much bigger and faster, so the figures are a bit quicker. But essentially, the difference is, Pyara Micro is not composable, okay? What that means is you cannot choose which bits you want. Technically, you can, in the sense that it all codes on GitHub and there is a way to choose which bits you want, but we haven't exposed it to anybody. Wildfly Swarm is, obviously, Spring Boot auto pulls in the bits you need, depending on what dependencies you set. Did I actually show the Spring Boot POM? I can't remember. Do you want to see it? <laughs> oh, wait till the end then, so. 
Uh, okay, so Pyramid Micro, you don't need Maven. You could build your NetBeans, build a WAR file, and deploy it. The others definitely both need Maven. So Pyramid Micro itself is a 60 megabyte jar. And then the WAR file that comes out of that is about one megabyte. Okay, Spring Boot, because it's quite minimal with a 26 meg jar file. Wildfly Swarm, even though it's composable, actually came out of a 100 megabyte jar. It's bigger than, than the others. Both, all of them booted in about four seconds. Okay, it's pretty, pretty much muchness, to be honest. And Power Micro Memory was about 34 meg old gen, and Metaspace was about 63 meg. Uh, Wildfly Swarm was similar, and Spring Boot was a bit, bit slightly bigger. All of them have an embeddable API, so you can actually just write, you know, well, obviously Spring Boot is embeddable API. You create a main and you do your stuff. Wildfly Swarm has a similar API. Pyora Micro has a similar API where you can write a Java main and bootstrap both con all the containers. Okay, so quick thoughts before I wrap up. The fun th thing, thing to think about about this is, one, these are all tiny, right? I could spend, as a, as a, as a developer of Pyramid, right, I could try and optimize this down, but this is just trivial numbers anyway. There's no point, okay? Spring was smartly smaller. But however, if you add a lot more other stuff, it'll grow, whereas this one won't grow. This is quite big, but it's still not massive by any, any means. Uh, and all of them run in very small memory footprints. So we're talking uh, tens of megabytes. All of these things will run on Raspberry Pis and stuff like that. It's not a problem. These things are all small. That's probably the takeaway from that. So, Pyro Micro thoughts. I obviously, I'm not going to say what I thought the Pyro Micro were. Uh, Spring Boot. Actually, I find it very, very, very simple to learn. It's marginally different from Java E. I could probably say it the other way around. Java E is marginally different from Spring because it took a lot of the ideas from Spring for Java E7. Slightly different REST annotations, but actually, other than that, it was very, it wasn't much. Not for building these RESTful web services to talk to the database, not a lot of difference. Has small footprint, has a fast startup, has a very small jar size, and that obviously did grow as you add more things into it. Slightly larger memory footprint, but we're talking noise, really. Uh, and I didn't have to figure out the composability of it, so I will show the POM at this point. So, so Spring Boot POM has in it basically uh, Spring Boot parent, start a web which brings me Tomcat and all the web stuff, uh, JPA, and then MySQL. Okay. So Spring Boot obviously has simplified Spring massively, because like I say, I built that in, in, a, in a morning from no knowledge whatsoever. I, I had done some Spring in the past, so I did, did uh, approach the task with some trepidation. However, with Spring Boot, it's incredibly easy. Wildfly Swarm. Okay, again, very small footprint, fast startup, small memory. Uh, some of the dependencies are quite complicated. Uh, this is one that took me the most to get to work. Okay? Uh, I added JAXRS and Weld, and it didn't work for ages. I couldn't work it out. Apparently, I needed to add JAXRS dash Weld as one unit. And hurrah, it worked. Uh, but otherwise, it's exactly the same. So what are my conclusions? One, I don't know why anyone wants to go around composing their own container. There's no point, to be honest. Wildfly Swarm actually came out bigger after composing it than, uh, than without, than Pyro Micro. So I'm not sure what benefits that gave you, other than a bit of complexity where you should really be concentrating on business logic, not working out whether you need JAXRS dash weld or JAXRS and weld. Uh, all of them are small, all of them are fast, all of them have very small footprints. So my conclusions as a Pyro Micro person is you should use Pyro Micro. But however, it wasn't really. My confusion, my, my, my conclusion actually was, what, was that these things are all so similar that anything arguments about which is best is probably I won't swear. It's probably irrelevant. If you know Spring, you, there is no reason whatsoever to use Pyro Micro. Pyro, you know, Spring Boot creates small, executable Java files. If you know Java EE, 
Okay, there's no reason to move to Spring just to get microservices. Okay, you can build microservice applications in Java EE with IR Micro or Spring or Wildfire Swarm. Okay, the Java EE apps were totally cross container. The source code was completely the same. Data source definitions was identical between IR Micro and Wildfire Swarm. Bit of subtlety around table names, but then all three are now. We are working on the same source data from MySQL. So all the code is there on GitHub. I've tried to make it so you should be able to just clone it and do Maven clean package and it works. But given Maven, that might not happen. Who knows what I've got in my repo. Uh, but it, it seems to work. So, any questions? Yep. No, I don't know where you get figures like that from, to be honest. Popularity figures. <laughs> I tried once for a venture capitalist, but it's really difficult to get popularity figures, to be honest. But each source is skewed. Uh, I don't know. I, I would say familiarity is where you want to go. If you know Spring, stick to Spring Boot. If you know Java EE, you don't need to migrate and learn Spring. Uh, they're both pretty popular. So it depends on the country. So in the UK is all massively spring. So in the US there's a lot of in Germany there's a lot of Java EE, so Yep. I don't know, because Java EE is a platform at the end of the day. It's a standard, so it's a baseline, okay? You can add whatever you like. People forget that you can add whatever you like into WAR, just like you can add whatever you like into Spring WAR. And if you don't need MongoDB, you can add MongoDB. You can get, uh, MongoDB will provide you with Java e integration capabilities. Uh, so, I don't really have a strong opinion what should be Java e 8 related to microservices. So, I think, you, you know, Jack's RS, it's all there, really. Not opinionated on it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Party time. Thanks. <laughs>